talking a little bit about Rothko's journey as a painter. How did he find his way to abstract expressionism? Um, so he, he started out painting figures and was inspired by some other older painters. And what was that journey like for him? Rothko's journey is, is in fact one that starts in Russia. And um, he's born in Russia as a young Jewish man in a Jewish family. They escape to America during the Nazi uprising and they come to the Pacific Northwest, and that's where he finds himself in Portland. Uh, he doesn't come to art until he moves as a young man to the East Coast. He goes to Yale for a couple of years. I forget what he studied there. Do you remember? Do you remember, Jim? I don't remember. He was... He did take some art classes while he was there, but I don't remember what his major He did take some art classes while he was there, but I don't recall what his major was, actually. He didn't stay at Yale for long, and his battles with Seagram's and the idea of, of putting paintings where rich people are spending a lot of money on really good food, you can see there's this class distinction for him all along. He doesn't last at Yale for very long. He goes to New York City to, as he says, bum around and starve for a little while. And he finds the Art Student League, which is an evening class setup, a weekend class setup, free classes for anybody who wants to take them. And he begins to latch on to this idea of art. I think the first style he really becomes interested in is surrealism. And this makes sense in New York in the 1930s, um, as a lot of surrealist artists are also being pushed out of Europe where they're living because of Nazi aggression, because of political turmoil. So New York City becomes a place where uh, Breton, Andre Breton is. He's not speaking English, right? Andre Breton will only speak French to people. Um, but he's there as the Pope of Surrealism, and many other artists clamor and, and um, come around Breton. Dali, Salvador Dali, is living in America at this time. Now, later Rothko uh, refutes their, their uh, influence on him, but some of my favorite Rothko works, in fact, are his 1930s, early 1940s paintings, where he's using these ideas of emotional turmoil, which, of course, the Surrealists love, right? They're in, uh, touting Freud's um, ideas of symbolism and psychology. And some of these early paintings are really quite beautiful, and they're um, forecasters of his later pure uh, expressionist work and abstract work, um, but they can be quite haunting as well. Images of people moving through the Manhattan landscape, say the subway system, where everybody is thin and emaciated and separated by psychological spaces. That's New York City today, actually, right? I feel that way when I ride the subway in Manhattan. Um, so he says he stomped out surrealism, but I think it's hard to get away from the influence of surrealism on him. Uh, he comes to the fore with other abstract expressionists in the post-war period, the late 40s, the early 50s. This is the time when Jackson Pollock is being uh, put in Life magazine under the heading, is he the greatest living American painter? The um, article goes on to make fun of Pollock and call his paintings macaroni. But in fact, if you're in Dubuque, Iowa in 1950 when that's published, suddenly you're reading about this abstract expressionist painter in your dentist office in Life magazine, and that's pretty powerful. Pollock died in 56 in a car accident, which I think was a suicide too. I agree with the play on that. Um, and then uh, we catch up with Rothko in the late 50s with the Seagram's um, mural project. He signed a contract for that in June of 1958, and then he turns over the project in summer of 1960. He works almost two years on that. Um, he goes on through the 60s to exhibit his work in a more limited way, have more control over how it's seen and where it's put, um, and he pays a lot of attention to setting up his um, setting up his estate so that his children and his wife will um, benefit from it if he dies. He um, is very careful about cataloging and organizing his work, very careful about who shows it, when and where. It's a control freak, you got that from the play, right? Uh, and then he uh, died, he suicides in February of 1970. Um, really at the height of his career, really recognized as an American master um, at that point.